Okay, so um, our panelists are here. So I, I'd like to introduce our first panel, which is on the subject of the datafication of the cultural record. Um, this panel explores, among other things, what is at stake and what is the status of the datafication of the cultural record? You know, what projects and initiatives are enabling greater access to the cultural record? What new insights can we generate through computational analyses of cultural records? And how are barriers being loaded or lo lowered to computational analysis of major texts? Finally, what political, social, and ethical questions arise in the creation, use, access, and sustainability of digital records and archives? Um, we have uh, five panelists as well as I'll be moderating this panel um, to introduce them in turn. So uh, Zach Kaiser, who will be presenting first, um, his, uh, his talk is called The Re Revolution Will Not Be Optimized. Zach is an artist, teacher, theorist, music producer, and DJ, and an assistant professor of graphic design and experience architecture at Michigan State. He has work in this art show down the hall. We should have apparently also asked him to do a DJ set, um, but we did not. Um, but his, his work critically engages with his background as a designer working in the tech industry and um, taking up the mantle of artist experimenter as experimenter to critique graphic design's participation in the distribution of the sensible. We have um, Jacopo Meyerston. He is an assistant professor of literature at UC San Diego. And he's interested in questions related to liter literary globalization in the ancient world. And his research addresses the relationships between literatures and hermeneutics of ancient Greece and Mesopotamia. He and Monty Johnson, uh, seated next to him, will be presenting a discussion of Diogenet, understanding social structure and the construction of knowledge in ancient Mesopotamia. Um, Monty Johnson is an associate professor in the Department of Philosophy and director of the Classical Studies Program in the Institute for Arts and Humanities at UC San Diego. His research focuses on the influence of Greco-Roman philosophy on modern science and philosophy, reconstructing lost works of philosophy and comparisons of ancient wisdom traditions. Molly Roberts, in the middle, um, is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science at UC San Diego. Her research interests lie in the intersection of political methodology and the politics of information, with a specific focus on methods of automated content analysis and the politics of censorship in China. Um, her talk is entitled, Understand the Impact of Censorship Through Text Data. And then finally, we have Danielle Dean, who's an assistant professor of visual arts at UC San Diego. Um, her work explores the colonialism of mind and body, the interpolation of thoughts, feelings, and social relations by power structures working through news, advertising, political speech, and digital media. She focuses on processes of construction of race, gender, age, and class that are generated through targeted marketing practices, commodifying subjectivities. So um, each of the panelists will present, um, and after the presentation, we'll have a discussion and audience Q&A. Yeah, so, so we'd like to invite the panel back up. Uh, we, have, we have about uh, 20 minutes for both an audience Q&A, and, and we can have a moderated discussion up here. So, um, so, so don't be shy if you want to come up and ask some questions, but uh, I'll try to get things started. So. Um, I mean that was that that was uh, you know quite an exciting, incitingly diverse range of talks, right? Um, you all were probably sitting here wondering uh, why you're on the same panel, um, and and but perhaps the audience was putting it together. But um, you know I think I think these talks opened up interesting perspectives on both the risks and the opportunities of the datification of different kinds of cultural records. Um, so we've learned that datification opens up um, you know, new forms of uh, censorship, social control, and perhaps the archives create a demand, some demand for digital labor, some demand for labor. Um, on the other side, you know, perhaps they open up new ways to understand the history of philosophy and the flow of um, information and influence. 
So I guess a starting question is, is there something inherently dangerous about datafication or archival practice, or is it simply dependent on how you use it? Well, I, I actually wanted to ask Molly a, a, a question of what conclusion I'm supposed to take away, because I was thinking, oh, well, so Chinese censorship is great then, because it's increasing, <laughs> it, it gets all these people interested in politics. Oh, um, that wasn't the, the conclusion you right, were supposed right, to take sorry. away. <laughs> <laughs> so I think um, <clears throat> this is one. I don't know if this is on or how I turn it on. Uh, this is just one example of a, a, it's really an exception to the rule. So if you look at all other data on blocks of websites within China, uh, it's, it's quite depressing that there these websites, the traffic is very much affected by, um, by censorship and there isn't a protective effect of censorship. So like if you look at when Wikipedia was blocked within China, um, on May 19th of 2015, all of Wikipedia was blocked. There's a big decrease in number of page views of Chinese language Wikipedia, and there's no uh, subsequent VPN increase, right? And that's interesting because <coughs> Wikipedia somehow doesn't have enough allure to get people across the wall, mostly I think because there is a substitute within China. Um, and. Um, uh, there are a lot of very interesting implications of that too. So we've looked at another piece of work, I've looked at how people were using Wikipedia and what I find is that they're mostly using it to, go, to search for um, uh, entertainment related things um, like uh, pop stars and that sort of thing, but they were coming across on Wikipedia historical topics and other things that, so Wikipedia was acting as a, um, as a, a gateway to political information, and then it was blocked, and then it, and then there was no protective effect. So it's all very specific, and I think we, there's so much more we need to understand about how people use information it in order to understand how this huge censorship apparatus is influencing um, what people know and the exchange of information more generally. So that doesn't answer your question. No, that's <laughs> <fine>. <laughs> Is this on? Yeah. yeah. Hey. Cool. Uh, I have a maybe a proposed answer to your question, or a related, uh, I don't know, question, which would be, I wonder if it's not about. I don't. I don't see it being as like datafication is inherently bad, or datafication is just a tool, and it's about how you use it. It's actually about the way the practices of datafication are uh, originated and distributed amongst the population. So there is a, if, if we don't see, the, you know, like if we don't see the way that the data is collected, we end up and we have ended up in a rather Kafkaesque situation. I mean, the, the best example of the way that like I talk to my students about this all the time. It's not Big Brother. 1984 is not the corollary for what we're living in. We're living in the trial. It's about sort of bureaucratic structures that we can't navigate because we don't know how data is being collected and manipulated because it's proprietary, right? So intellectual property plays a huge role in it. Um, and of course, the intellectual property is, is about protecting capitalist interests. So I don't think datafication is inherently bad. I think it's the, the structures on which datafication is typically built that pose uh, social problems. Um, you have the price here? Or no, just come on to it. OK, so um, <laughs> in the ca case of classics, I think um, using uh, techniques of the data science uh, can actually be very sub subversive. And this is because, um, for example, Greece and Rome have become part of this myth of civilization of the West. And uh, many kind of pre-made stories are passed down in generation after generation. People, for example, go to the college to they want to know the classics because they're an example of um, well behavior and uh, know the origin of uh, Western knowledge and so on. But when you use these techniques, you can dismantle many of these myths. 
And you can see that there's not really a correlation between democracy and the formation of philosophy, for example. And uh, you can actually use um, topic modeling, for instance, to read um, Homer and discover that um, you don't need to publish uh, 21 books about interpretation of the Iliad to know about what it is about, right? So there's some, they can simplify some task, but at the same time can subvert um, myths that have, that have been passed down generation after generation, and which are really um, very har harmful. For example, if you are not um, European descendant and that you are confronted with those texts that tell you that there is a, a moment in history of superiority when people discover truth, and um, you feel kind of alienated. But you can use the machine to turn things upside down and say, well, this is not what is happening here. What is happening here is there's a huge network that extends from India to Rome, for example, and the people are trading ideas, and what we see is just a few of the part of the communication that were spread out through that network and in which, uh, for example, race and ethnicity did not matter because people could just exchange ideas uh, through the network, uh, no matter what, with language, what they're speaking, or how they were looking like. So potentially, um, data science is there for a subversive move in the humanities, right? Of course, there's the other side of those who are trying to sell us stuff and to get us to do things, but um, this is the choice, right? Great, thank you. Um, question in the audience? Yeah, come there's a microphone up here, actually. It'd be great if, if you have questions. We can hear you, yeah. Uh, I'm going to address this primarily to Zach, but to all of you. Uh, Zach, you presented a problem. I wonder whether it's something deeper than when the control of the system. Because it seems like a human condition. Because we possess language, whether it's visual language, formal language, music, mathematics. And language is always a representation of an inadequate representation of the way that things really are, okay? And so therefore, in a sense, you can never get beneath that. You always attract within the system itself, and yet you present it as if like somehow there's something different that traps us, but in fact is the human condition of us having language. Now, of course, we could not have language, but we don't want to be there. <laughs> because it seems like very important to have language to distinguish us from just sort of merely reacting to the world as it is. So how do you get around that? I mean, to a certain degree, you answer it by saying, like, yes, you have to be careful of who, who's controlling the representation, but still deeper than that is that it is a representation. Whoa. Uh, <laughs> well... Since I have philosophy colleagues here now, I'm absolutely terrified to present any kind of answer to that. Um, <laughs> oh, yes, the question was, wow, okay, I'm, man, it's even terrifying to repeat it. So the, the question sort of suggested that I may be presenting an issue with, I don't know how, to, how, how would I describe that, the, in, the human condition as like like we have language and language mediates our experience of the world so there is no of course like di like is there a direct experience of the world when all we have is language and that it's possible that maybe the problem i'm posing is like too surface and it's actually a problem of the human condition as opposed to a problem of control of systems um yeah i don't know i <laughs> i guess my my point maybe is is that um, I, I talk to my, so I teach graphic design. Um, I teach a very sort of practical, pragmatic thing to students who are, it's a very, you know, it's a pre-professional degree. They're gonna go out in the world and you know, work for ad agencies and that kind of stuff, um, which is kind of at odds with what I just talked to you about. And um, one of the things that we talk about is the way that graphic design in a lot of ways sort of shapes the 
parameters of possibility in our lives. So we talk about recycling uh, posters as one example. And we say like, oh, you know, have you seen, how many people have seen a recycling poster today? And all the students are like, yeah, I saw a poster promoting recycling. And I said, how many of you, you know, know about the fact that most of America's recycling is right now sitting in you know, warehouses because the people that we used to ship it to won't take it? And they're like, what? And, and the question becomes like, you know, the way that we see the world, whether it's through language or through design sort of constrains what we think is possible or what we think is impossible. Um, and I think to some extent, when, when it comes back to computation and, and data uh, or the datification of the world, I think that we're constrained in part by, we're hampered in part by the way the systems have been built. And I think language is, is certainly part of it, but I also think that the, the interests that have constructed those systems then perpetuate their use uh, through the sort of modulation of our visual and verbal field. So I think in part it is language and, and people do have control for the language. You talk about, we use metaphors, like I'm, I'm programmed or wired to do X. You know, I think part of that comes from um, the ideologies that are sort of, that we live within. Um, but again, we're, you know, here getting lines on our CVs and talking about all these things and, you know, participating in the capitalist academe. So, you know, <laughs> take, take my words with a grain of salt. Well, since you uh, mentioned philosophy, I'll just chime in. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I will take a position that, that um, data is not uh, intrinsically evil or dangerous or something like that. I mean, I, I would define data as, you know, things that are known or assumed to be facts and they are the basis of reasoning and calculation. And so they're incredibly important to um, reasoning our way out of problems that we have. Uh, and I, I think that there are problems with um, controlling data, controlling access to data, I see as a problem. I see a problem with people not being educated how to use data or distinguish data from falsehoods. And, and to me, the solutions have to do with education. And so teaching people what data is, how to distinguish between data and non-data, and how to use these technological um, instruments uh, to, to empower them instead of have them be uh, controlled by uh, other people. Uh, so um, I, 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 the, the, the premise of the question that datification is um, that there's something inherently evil about that that's 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 like saying there's something inherently evil about facts and that would be the case if um, the facts of our situation are evil but that wouldn't be a that wouldn't be a problem for data that's a problem with us is there someone that controls who or what counts as data Uh, well, reality controls what counts as data. Yeah. So, so you know, saying saying of what is that it is, and saying of what is not that it is not, is the difference between data and non-data. So yes, there there is there's a big objective control over what it is. I think that what would be dangerous is to claim that. It doesn't, uh, that there isn't data, there aren't facts. There is no way to distinguish between truth and falsehood. In fact, I think, I think that is the basis of, the, of, of a lot of the problems we're facing. And the, the, the fact that people are increasingly unable to distinguish data from falsehood. Uh, that, that is what I see as the problem. And, so, and I don't see that problem being solved by, um, by arguing that we should have less data or less access to data. We should, we should educate people of how to use data and, and what it is. So yeah, it, it is, it is um, it's controlled by what's true. And so unless we're gonna maintain a thesis that nothing's true or nothing's real, uh, then I don't see us getting away from, from data. Um. I think one interesting question to sort of think about is um, when we think about how data is used, 
is how are we using, with what objective function are we optimizing, right? So, um, and you talked a lot about optimization and, um, and um, I think that one of the problems that we are facing, I study digital politics, of course, one of the problems that we are facing in the digital, in digital um, politics is that um, the way that our data is used um, is to optimize clicks for the most part um, when it comes to commercial um, optimization. And um, this has a lot of negative consequences for other things that we might think are more important to optimize. <laughs> um, so when we optimize clicks, we maybe start you know, getting recommendations on YouTube uh, for things that um, are entirely false, or um, we have sort of these um, these unintended consequences of um, of how our data is used, and they're not being optimized necessarily to the consumer themselves or to who whose data are being used um, in the optimization method. So, um, and I don't know how. Um, so I think a lot of social media companies right now are trying to re re um, think about what uh, what they should be optimizing for, and I think that that is a, a really difficult question when there is one company, so for example, optimizing for an entire community, um, and when the um, actual what the community wants is is not necessarily always being thought about in that process. So, and that goes back to just the fundamental power structures rather than the data the data itself, the power structures that have been in place for you know, long before data was ever monetized. <laughs> I mean, oh, can you hear me? I, I also think that data can be dangerous. Sorry, maybe I'm on the, but I just think because it, it seems like this question of, of how it is to be um, um, organized into a fact is the question of whether it's a fact in the first place because if it's to do with a set of like um, uh, variables that make the 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 um, organizing of the data that comes to a truth, like isn't there other possibilities of that truth? So therefore, how do we we always have to be sort of um, uh, nervous of taking it as the only fact? I don't know. That I mean, it seems like it. I'm not a data expert, so I feel nervous to say this, but I'm, I'm worried about the, the, not just about who makes the, the decisions on the data, but, but, but how, how those um, variables are put into uh, the system. To follow, so I don't know if this one's working now, but um, to, to, f to follow up on that, um, I think kind of on a, on a similar theme, um, you know, we've seen a mix of sort of uh, digital native archives, like. Twitter did not, it has no sort of, I mean, it has a material presence, but it's a digi digital native format. Um, and the kinds of systems of quantification and analytic that Zach was describing are also sort of, um, you know, digital native. But I think all of these, um, you know, and as opposed to um, the Diogenet project, you know, where we're dealing with like digitized versions of, of you know, what were texts and, the Danielle digitized versions of, you know, kind of archival footage and the rest, but all these things are thread through with, um, you know, all of these pursuits have a balance of human observation, human coding, and automated processes. I mean, I think um, with Danielle, you, you know, part of this ongoing project is like to reach out to see who the human coders who are like doing this labor. So I'd just be interested to hear a perspective from any of you on sort of this, these, balances between human labor and automated labor, um, you know, where, kind of what that says about our state. <laughs> so. I mean, I, I don't know what to say, but I mean, I think that, that um, there's, it seems like there's this assumption that maybe at a certain point we won't need the human labor to, to, to get to this point in which data will be able to uh, um, maybe function on its own without human input. And I don't know if that's necessarily, I don't believe in that that's, I don't know, it's not happening right now. And so therefore, I think that we need to really think about that, like the, the not only the, um, the conditions of labor behind such work, but also what, um, 
how how um, how do you say how how reliable maybe the data can be because it's coming from humans. Like that's exciting to me that maybe sometimes we may not be getting reliable data because we are, as humans might not always be completely rational. And the, cause that's why in a way I was sort of interested to look at the, the, um, the history of labor conditions within um, Ford that wasn't so much about computers as such, but does have some aspects of the ways in which digital um, um, data is formulated in our present, because it does have so much to do with the history of the assembly line. And but it's just a kind of um, 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 there was more humans involved with that. And so anyway, I just think that there's something to to be seen in the kind of um, ways in which he, we as humans fail and that that's kind of amazing that we fail and uh, not not that we fail and that it's amazing that things go wrong but that we aren't fully rational all the time i don't know that was a ramble but <laughs> <laughs> uh, no I, I appreciate that i you know i think we we're just we have a few minutes left but it seems like we have a few more questions maybe one more question from Is the audience like on now? yeah i think it's on so um, data is everywhere. Uh, our genome is our personal data. The use and care and monetization of data can get people in trouble. Uh, I think we own our copyright on ourselves somehow. Um, uh, the question I have is how do you handle when data, the truth of data, changes through time? Culturally, cities move when they're destroyed. So geospatially, this new, this location of information has uprooted and moved 100 miles to the east or something. How do you change the truth through time, but record when it changed and why it changed? And the other thing about the constant upgrading cycle, that's an unnatural process. The, the a natural process is a cyclical. You have improvements and then you have decay. And so if you don't form a naturally occurring process, you will lead to collapse without uh, a future. So um, one of the things that DeHawk uh, talks about is the, the balance point between chaos and order, the k -ord. And it's, it's an energy that maintains a cycle of creation and destruction. And this is an, a way of organizing businesses and groups. So I, I would think that uh, thinking about these things is not an ever-growing economy that, yeah, that's not going to happen. There will be a collapse. Anyhow, my thoughts. My oh, I'll just say something really briefly uh, in response to that and, and perhaps clarify something I said. I mean, I, I took the first presentation to not be saying data is, is um, the bad thing, but optimization, because the question is optimization for what? Optimization means making things better or making them the best. Well, what's your definition of best? You know, profit or human flourishing, um, intelligence, knowledge, virtue. I mean, some of those I can get on board with optimizing and others not. Uh, and so, I, and and um, and and also with the comment that it matters what we do with data. That's certainly true. So data is is you know the basis for reasoning and calculation. But how we reason and calculate with it makes all the difference. And what obviously what data we're collecting and that sort of thing. Uh, but I just I just want to say that I don't um, that. You know, uh, knives are evil because they cut people, but they also help us, uh, you know, butter bread and things like that. And so, the, what what we do is educate people how to use knives, um, and then hopefully that minimizes the danger and optimizes our ability to use them for things we want to do, like eat. But uh, it would be odd to say that that there that uh, that utensil itself is, is evil. And I think it would be really dangerous in the case of, of data, because as I understand data, it, it, it's related to facts. So if we throw that out, we're throwing out the idea there's facts. Uh, and, and then it seems to me there's only power. 
if, if there aren't facts of the matter about what's going on, then it's just whoever is more powerful and, and, and persuasive is what we'll be following, not based on facts or truths. Uh, we were together, but we don't agree. <laughs> 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 so, um, and I have to say that I don't like the word data. And this is because uh, I am really old school. So I am not a 500, uh, 500 years old, but I, I feel like that. So in literary studies, we use the word source uh, for what we're studying. And the source is, makes you feel like a, like, like a detective, right? You go to the source, and you ask the source, and you get stuff. So in, when I work with my students, I define what data is, because it's what we're looking for. So we're looking for this relationship, and it's an intentional act that actually creates the data. So, and since I know in Latin, then I have to say, tell you the data means what is given, right? So it's what he's saying, the data is what is given, but um, it, at least not for me. It's, uh, it, it's big, but it depends on the choice that I'm making and determines what I want to find because uh, it's part of the, sti the, the science study. Um, so I, I wanted to make a, a comment on this on this point, just from one very narrow perspective. What I love about being on a panel with people from all over the humanities and social sciences is like we're all trained so differently, so we all think about things in different ways. But what your comment reminded me of was um, something that I think a lot of social scientists are thinking about right now with concern to data science, which is um, sort of algorithmic decision making, right? So. And so if you have an algorithm making a decision about something, right, um, <clears throat> which is not necessarily a new thing. We've had, we've had data making decisions in politics for a long time. But maybe it's a more complicated algorithm now than it was before. Um, and then the data changes, right? So then how does that impact the performance of the algorithm and um, what the algorithm was supposed to be doing. So an example of this is um, like predictive policing. There's a lot of concern. Uh, predictive policing is used to say, this is where the police should go because this is where the crime is, right? So the problem is, of course, is that when even if that worked perfectly, which I don't think it did in the first place, but if it did, is then then the police went there and then they, oh, they found more crime there and then, oh, they really got to go there. And so it's like this weird feedback loop because the data is changing and nobody's uh, calibrating it. Um, Another example of this is in, in censorship in China, some of it is algorithmically done. Um, and so like say that there's certain combinations of words that make it so you can't post something, right? Well then, as you might expect, um, people are very creative and they come up with lots of other words that could be used to make it so they can post. And in one of those cases, we would want the algorithm and the data scientists to combat this feedback loop, and in the other of these cases, we wouldn't, right? In, in, the, in the censorship case, we wouldn't want the algorithm. We, we would like people to continue to be able to get around. So I think, I think what that highlights is two different things. One is that the data changing is fundamental to the performance of the algorithm. And the second is the performance, whether we want the algorithm to perform well, is, um, is a social science and a philosophical and a, and a, a question of values. And I think that that's, Th those are all interesting questions to try to, to try to explore. I don't have answers. Yeah. OK, well, um, Jessica, OK, OK. Um, uh, thank you all for, for this fascinating panel. Can we please thank our panelists? <laughs>